joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Good morning, Christ Church of the Valley family and friends. Hallelujah. It is Christmas time, and it's time to show love and to give, and most of all, to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord for being here today. We made it. We made it. We're victorious. And the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Hallelujah. Well, let us pray and usher in the presence of a God. Bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. <laughs> we love you and we thank you for being your children. We thank you that you care about us and you have kept us, Lord, up until this moment, Lord God. So we thank you, Lord God. We thank you, and we thank you most of all for sending your only begotten son for us. Lord, we love you. We can't even thank you enough for that, Lord God, for salvation, for everlasting life, and for abundant life right now, Lord. So we love you, Lord God, and we pray that you would have your way in this service, Lord God. Use us for your glory, Lord God, to touch hearts, to touch minds, to touch spirits, Lord God. Let us connect to you today and every day, Lord God. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God is so good. He is so good. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, this is the time of year where I like to annoy my family with uh, Christmas songs, morning, noon, and night. Amen. <laughs> and I came across this song that I remember my grandma used to sing and back in the Paramount Baptist Church. And I think you would know this if you grew up in a Baptist church, an AME church, a church of God in Christ, you, you know this one. So I want you to sing with me. Sing with me as we go tell it on the mountain. And here it goes. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Everybody say it. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds keep their watching, the silent flocks by night. Beyond throughout the heavens, there's shown a holy light. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. The shepherds feared and trembled when low above the earth bring out the angels' caress that held a Savior's word. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain. Christ is born down in a lowly manger. Our humble Christ was born, and God sent us salvation that blessed Christmas morn. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills, and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain. Christ is born. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah, go tell it on mountain over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Glory to you. Christ is born. Amen and amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, let us prepare our hearts for the word of God from our shepherd, Pastor Corey Saxton. Amen. Amen. Amen and hallelujah. Amen and hallelujah. Man, that song got me excited and it got me up. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Um, we are in the season of the birth of our risen Savior. Um, how important was his life? All of humanity's existence staked, was staked upon the safe arrival, the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. So go tell it on the mountain. Go tell somebody today. I'm here because of Jesus. I'm alive because of Jesus. I'm grateful for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for your life, your example. Um, and the gift that you are to all of us. Amen. Um, so just a couple reminders before we jump into the word. Get your elements ready because as the, at the end of service we're going to do as we usually do. And go ahead and take our communion. And then also share the gospel on your timeline. Thank you for everybody who puts um, our service out there to your friends, your family, your loved ones. We never know who needs the gospel. So this is our way uh, because of technology and Facebook Live that we can share the gospel, all of us. Amen. So I invite you to do that this morning. So let's pray. Father, we're grateful. We thank you. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. In this week, as we celebrate Christmas, Lord God, we're grateful for the arrival of the risen Savior. We're thankful, Lord God, that you loved us so much that you sent your only son to the earth to save us, Lord God. We thank you for the blood that it was shed over 2,000 years ago, but it still works today. So we're grateful for forgiveness of sins. We're grateful for eternal life. We're grateful for your presence via the Holy Spirit in our lives today. Lord, we ask that you be with us in this service, be in my mouth, be in our, my heart, um, be in the delivery, Lord God, so that those that are listening can receive you, Lord God, not just a good sermon or a great talk or a pep talk or anything like that, but let them receive your spirit. Awake something on the inside of us that is been dead or uh, allow something to be birthed as you did your son Lord God on the inside of us Lord God that we can be on fire for you so we love you and praise you in Jesus name amen amen well good morning Christ Church of the Valley good morning church family good morning visitors um, I pray that you're well um, I pray that you're in a festive mood this is our last Sunday um, before we mentioned it our Savior's birthday uh, before Christmas um, it's gonna be a little different this year with COVID um, but I still pray that you enjoy it um, and that God gives you his very best and then you give your very best back to him because if you made it in 2020 I don't care if you have any don't have any gifts under the tree I don't care if you don't have a big festive dinner I don't care if big mom and them can't fly out and enjoy Christmas with you but if you made it you are truly blessed amen um, because everybody didn't make it um, through this year um, so I was gonna do a, a traditional Christmas sermon and the Lord um, told me, don't just tell them about my son's birth. Tell them about what his life was about. So we're not going to be traditional this Christmas. Uh, we're going to move away from it. You know, typically they talk about the birth of Jesus only, the three wise men that came, the gifts of um, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We're not going to preach on that. In fact, if you want a sermon on that, I just gave it. Amen. Just say amen. And that one's over. We're going to go into a second service, a second sermon, and talk about something a little bit different this week. Um, we're going to talk about being reconciled. So the, so the title of today is called Be Reconciled. Amen. Write that down in your notes. We're still in our Blueprint series um, with our five F's, faith, family, finance, fitness, and focus. So we're on our, we've moved to our second F. We're on family. So we're going to stay on that trend. Um, last week, we dealt with um, God not giving up on us. Amen. This week, we're going to talk, of, or, or sorry, last week, we dealt with he's able not giving up on God. 
This week, we're going to talk about how God never gave up on us. In fact, he still continues to pursue all of those who are still wayward, who haven't said yes to Jesus Christ. God is in a forever pursuit of us into our very last breath. Um, so this week, we're going to talk about him not giving up on us. Um, and we talk about giving up. We live in such a cancel culture today. Um, in, in society, so many people are being canceled. If you do the wrong thing, say something that somebody doesn't like, you're winding up on somebody's blog or Facebook or Instagram. You got people with two followers talking about they canceling people. How does that even work, right? It's so easy to throw people away. Like, and people are living according to their favorite song lyrics more than they are their favorite scripture. Amen? Like, they got songs out there that say, no new friends. And people are listening to it and won't let anybody else into their circle. They refuse to love anybody else new because the song said no new friends. Then they got songs that talk about throwing away the old friends that you have, right? Cancel them. Let's cancel everybody. And those two ideas couldn't be further from the truth. Um, we have to, have to live according to the word versus living according to the world's standards. Amen. The Bible doesn't say to tolerate your brother or to tolerate one another. The Bible gives us a firm directive to love one another. Love your brother. What is love? Um, the Bible describes it as being patient, kind, enduring, and long-suffering. Amen? So, so there's a bright side of love where it's easy to do, but it's nothing easy about being patient. Right? Nothing easy about long suffering. Amen. Um, the Bible doesn't describe love as an easy thing. It just gives it um, one as an order. God is and, and then God is love. God is love. It just describes it as this is what we're supposed to do. Um, so today we're going to read some scriptures. We're going to talk about love. We're going to talk about reconciliation. Um, I want you to turn in your Bible to the book of Philemon. Philemon. Right now, where's Philemon? Let me give you an assist. It's in the New Testament. It's wedged between Titus and Hebrews. Um, may not be one of the more popular books in the Bible or the New Testament, but it's very relevant to our topic today um, as far as reconciliation goes. So go ahead and turn to the book of Philemon. We're going to start in verse 7. Um, we'll do a little reading this morning. Amen. Amen. Verse 7 says, For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. So I, I just love Paul's writings, right? He, he starts off affirming you. He says, you, you so bad, right, that the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. You're bringing joy, like you're awesome, you're amazing. Paul, like, lifts you up, and he, and he makes you feel like a million and one bucks, and then he begins to lower the boom with truth, Amen. Amen. So now listen to this, starting with verse eight. Accordingly, um, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required. Yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, now a prisoner also of Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I have become in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. Jump down to verse 15. Um, Philemon 16 says, For this perhaps is why he has parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. No longer as a bondservant or a slave, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Verse 17. So if you consider me your partner, Receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge it to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. 21 says, confident of your obedience I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. Amen. So let's break this down. Let's unpack it. Um, Philemon, it, it, the whole book, again, is all about reconciliation and relationships as Christians and how they should go. Uh, Philemon was a successful property owner. Um, he was a Colossian Christian, and he was more than likely converted to Christianity um, as Paul spent time with the people in Colossae. 
Amen. So Paul is writing this letter to Philemon on behalf of his brother Onesimus, which and his words Onesimus, the name Onesimus means very useful. It means very useful. Onesimus was a runaway slave and his master was Philemon. So Onesimus had stolen some money, as the story goes. He stole a sum of money from his slave master, um, Philemon, and he ran away. Eventually, he winds up um, in the same place that Paul is. He winds up in jail, right? Perhaps for stealing. I don't know. We know he's a thief. The, the scripture says he's a thief. So he stole something. He ran away. He winds up in jail. And under the teaching of Paul, Onesimus becomes saved while he's in prison, from prison. So here's a sidebar. Onesimus had to go to jail in order to get free. So be careful about writing people off. How many of us know people that have gone to jail and that are in jail? Right. And then they find Christ and then the world second guesses it. Oh, they just found Christ because they were in prison. Maybe it took that for Jesus Christ to reach him, for the message of the gospel to reach him. Amen. Uh, so he gained more value by being locked up. If God doesn't give up on prisoners, then neither should we. Amen. Just something for you to put in your pocket. Amen. Back to the text. Um, Paul wrote this letter at the same time he wrote the letter to the Colossians church, to the, to the Colossians. And he sent the letters back, these important letters that wind up being scripture. Right. So we have the book of Colossians. Um, that's a very important to, um, piece to the gospel story. And then we have this letter to his master Philemon or his former master. And Paul sends him as Onesimus is exiting jail. He sends him back with these two important documents. So Paul trusted this man. Right. And scripture tells us that there's a plot twist here. So Paul wasn't asking Philemon to accept Onesimus back as a slave. He was telling him, not only accept him back, but not as a slave, but as your brother into your household. Now, that's a heck of an ask. You think about it. Not only was he a slave, but this guy stole from him. How many people have stolen from you in your life and you said never again will they be allowed back into my house? Not only did he steal from him, he was a slave. It, it, that's countercultural, right? Back then, if you were a slave and you stole from your slave master... Right? The reward wasn't that you get to come back and live in a house rent free as a brother. The reward was you were beaten. You were hanged. You were flogged. Something was going to happen to you physically and they were going to break you down. But he said, listen, those were his old ways. That's his former self. You need to accept them back. Right. And, and he says, accept them as you would accept me. So Paul is using his clout. And if he owes you something, me, Paul, charge it to my account. I pay it back. You see, the Christians res respected Paul because he was a leader in um, getting the gospel out to the world, especially in this area of Asia in which they were. So he's saying, listen, accept him as your brother back into your house. That's a, that's a difficult ask. That's a difficult ask. Uh, the Lord ever asked you to do something that didn't make sense? Right. If you're obeying the spirit, then you may find that he'll do that quite often. Right. Remember, his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He wouldn't care, uh, handle it the same way that we handle our situations. Right. So, again, this request, it was literally unheard of. And Paul challenges Philemon in verse 17. He says, so if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. That's a direct challenge. Right. So Paul then gives his word again that he was going to repay this debt if Onesimus had any. Um, I'm here to tell you today that the level of forgiveness that Philemon had to have, it goes beyond forgiveness. He's asking him not to forgive. He's asking him to be reconciled to Onesimus, to make that relationship whole again. Right. So do you know the difference between forgiving someone and reconciliation? A lot of people don't. Uh, the Bible tells us not to only forgive, but to be reconciled. It charges us to reconcile, work out our differences and, and build the relationship back. Right. So forgive is from a Greek word, aphiemi, meaning in relation to an offense against us, we're supposed to send that away. We're supposed to dismiss the offense. We're supposed to omit it or emit it. 
It means that we dismiss it completely and send it away. It doesn't mean that we get back necessarily with the people who offended us. It just means that we drop the offense. We don't hold that offense against them any longer. Um, again, doesn't require us, in, when you're talking straight forgiveness, doesn't require us to go back and make amends and get buddy-buddy with the person. It just means whatever happened between us, I'm just going to long forget it. Amen? It, it's out of my heart. Right? Um, easier said than done, but we're commanded and given instructions according to the word of God that we're supposed to forgive because we're forgiven. Right? But in the Bible, it also talks about reconciliation. The word reconciliation is less commonly used. Generally, at least in scripture, right, it deals with the relationship um, between God and humanity. Reconciliation is from a Greek word, katalage, meaning an exchange, to be reconciled or restored to favor. Reconciliation assumes that the relationship was broken. Something has happened that has caused the two parties to become estranged. The two might have been friends, um, you know, you've had some kind of close relationship, might have been a business relationship, might have been an intimate marriage, but reconciliation, the need for reconciliation is saying that something has come between them. So reconciliation involves forgiveness. Forgiveness doesn't necessarily involve reconciliation, amen? When I forgive someone, again, there's no guarantee that the relationship will be restored. But reconciliation restores that relationship. Forgiveness may be one-sided. Reconciliation requires both parties to be willing to participate, participate in the restoring of that relationship. It's always possible, and according to the word, it's expected, right, that I forgive. It's always possible to forgive, um, and it's expected according to the word that I forgive. But reconciliation will not be possible if the other party is not willing to participate. So forgiveness is a command. Again, it can be hard. Um, the follow up to the Lord's Prayer in, Mark, in Matthew 6 is very clear. Um, if we are unwilling to forgive others, there's no reason to expect God to forgive us. So it covers that um, in the Lord's Prayer. It tells us to forgive and then it follows it up in Matthew 6, 14 and 15. Don't expect God to forgive you if you can't do that very simple thing of forgiving. But the Bible also says as far as forgiveness goes, bear with each other. And forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. Again, that's in Colossians 3 and 13. Forgiveness isn't necessarily a two-way street like I've been talking about. One, one person may have a problem of thinking forgiveness um, in this way. If I forgive you, then you're supposed to forgive me. No, it doesn't say that. right? All you have to do is you forgive and you've done your part. You can't control other people. You can't control um, their actions, their activities. You can't control their motives, their heart. But you'd be doing your job according to the word of God if you let the offense go on your end, right? Um, it does, it, again, scripture doesn't put a limit on forgiveness in that way that the other person has to also forgive. In fact, it's quite the contrary. The examples that Jesus, of Jesus and Stephen, so if you look at Luke 23 and 34, and then you look at um, Stephen's story um, in Acts 7 and 60, both demonstrate forgiveness. And the wrong was occurring in the moment. They prayed for their oppressors. They prayed for the very people that were killing them in the moment and said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They know not what their sins are all about. Forgive them. Right. So we are to seek reconciliation where it's possible. Romans 12 and 18 talks about being reconciled. It says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably among among all. Paul tells us that if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, again, live peaceably amongst everybody. We should strive for reconciliation. We should strive for it always. Amen. Amen. Um, God showed me his power through reconciliation. And um, I, I definitely am going to share a personal testimony and, and story with you. Um, but let me see. Let me, let me find it. What is my responsibility when I have damaged a relationship with another person? 
I need to forgive them for whatever offense is between us. I should also seek reconciliation. But reconciliation may not be possible all the time. I have no control on how the other person might respond. For, for, but for my part, I should make the attempt. Amen? Even if it doesn't work out, I should continue to do my best to live peaceably, as Paul says, amongst them. We shouldn't worry about the other party as much as we're worried about doing our part. More important than human reconciliation, though, is the reconciliation between God and humanity. One impact of our life um, here on earth, the one impacts our life here on earth, and the other impacts our eternity. Receiving forgiveness from God and being reconciled from him are of utmost importance. As much as we need to be reconciled to one another, it's more important to be reconciled to God. Man was in need of reconciliation since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. Because of this one decision, man was separated from God. A blood sacrifice had to be made on their behalf. And in the Old Testament, this is what they do, did. They made blood sacrifices over and over and over again to atone for their evil doing, for, to atone for their sin. God sent his only son as the, one, as the last sacrifice, the sacrificial lamb, if you will. Him being slain, right, saved all of mankind and gave us forgiveness. Accepting Jesus as your personal savior is the only way to be reconciled to God. Without Jesus dying on the cross to be atonement for your sin, exchanging his life for our sins, his lives for ours, there will be no way possible to be reconciled with the father. You see, Jesus took away and he continues to take away the sins of the world. He allows us to have eternal life. This is what his life was about, for us to be reconciled to the Father. He gave his life so that we can be reconnected to the Father. The relationship was broken because of the original sin. And he called us back to him. He allowed us to be reconciled. The broken relationship is now fixed. All you have to do is say yes to Jesus Christ. He allows us all to be his children through this process of reconciliation. So as far as myself and reconciliation, because I got forgiveness, it took me a while to be able to forgive. I had a heart where, I mean, if you messed up with me, you probably on the outs. I may not have said it to you, but I put up a wall in my heart. Anybody who wronged me when I was younger, I had a problem with forgiveness. Uh, but God showed me in his word, and then he, get, he put it in my spirit. If you don't forgive, I won't forgive. If you don't forgive other people, then I won't forgive you. And then I thought, well, I don't need forgiveness. And then he showed me my life. And I said, well, I need a lot of forgiveness. And I said, well, they did this and they did this. He said, listen, they killed my son. My son on the cross forgave them for killing him while they were killing him. And you can't forgive this or that offense. Shame on me. So God put forgiveness in my heart and I started releasing myself of the burden of trying to hold someone else's um, old thing that they've done to me in my heart. I was trying to hold all that stuff in and literally making myself sick. So God healed me of that. But then he started showing me further than uh, forgiveness, reconciliation goes. So God showed me through my earthly father what reconciliation was all about. My father was estranged from my life for most of my life, uh, from the time I was a kid all the way up into uh, my adult life. I grew up in a single parent household. My mom was hardworking, God fearing. We were in church um, just pretty much every day. About four days a week, we had some kind of church meeting, church service. We did double church service on Sunday. Uh, we had all kinds of revivals. Like, I just remember growing up in church. If I wasn't in church or the Boys and Girls Club, um, sometimes I would get a nap in at home. But most of the time, we were in church. My dad was a drug addicted um, person that was often in prison. Um, very little connection with my dad growing up. I knew who he was, but I didn't know who he was, if you know what I mean. Um, oftentimes, I would, t I would tell myself that I didn't need him and I didn't care about him. That was the only way I could deal with it. I'm better off without him. Amen. Uh, for the better part of 35 years, my dad was addicted. He was either in prison um, or on the streets, living between halfway houses um, or drug houses and things like that. I'd see him so often. He looked bad. Sometimes I would be too embarrassed because of his appearance to even approach him if I was with friends and I'd see him on the street because we were in the same city. But as an adult, when I was 35 years old and I had a family of my own, 
my dad was released from prison this last time. And he said that forever, I'm done with these drugs. I'm done with jail. And I'd heard that not a million times, but a billion times before. Over time, he'd gotten out. And I would see him and I'd visit him here and there. I'd be constantly irritated. He'd call and I'd um, choose to send him the voicemail most time. It says, not today. I don't feel like dealing with him today. And this is the way I dealt with him. And the Lord would show me myself. And I'd be convicted and answer the phone because God says, listen, you messed up before. You mess up all the time. What if you called upon me and, and I sent you the voicemail? So I got out of cancel culture and stopped canceling my dad. I started getting into forgiveness and forgiving him for what he did. I dropped the offense. I said, listen, if he could have done better, he probably would have. And, you know, I just moved away from having a hard heart, started talking to him more. Over time, he started getting better and he wasn't having any relapses. So I started to buy in and say, man, this might work this time. Started bringing him around my family more. Um, and, and we were gelling for the first time in my life. Then we got news that my dad became very sick and his sickness was going to more than likely take his life between one to three years. It was devastating news right when we started getting close again. You see, we were away for 33, 34 years or, or even more. And then all of a sudden, as soon as our relationship starts getting better, he's not doing drugs. He hasn't been to prison. Uh, he gets a life sentence as far as his health goes that he's going to die soon. The Lord put it in my heart to even spend more time with them, right? Um, and, and, and it became hard again, again, because I would go back and forth. You know, even though I forgave him, sometimes I would remember, man, when I was a kid, he wasn't there for me. And my heart would begin to harden again. And then my wife would massage it and say, but remember, we're, we're called to love. So as I spent time with him and spent more time with him, I began to grow closer and closer, more and more fond of him. Until the point he got to the point to where he couldn't take care of himself and he was living out in Los Angeles. The Lord called me and my wife to do something strange. Remember, I asked you, the Lord ever called you to do something unconventional that didn't make sense in the moment. So he says, go get your dad, move him to the city that you now live in around the corner from you. And I was like, that can't be God. You know, you know I, I, that can't be God. And, and he repeated it. So we went down. We got him. We moved the in next to us. Um, so that we can see him on a regular basis, help to take care of him. But with that came an increase in all of his bills. So that led to us having to support him financially. Right. Um, and that was tough because here's a man. Now we have to help to pay his rent. We have to buy his essentials. We have to buy his groceries. We have to take him to the doctor. We have to buy his medicine because he just didn't have enough. So the Lord had me contributing to someone that never made one child support payment in my life. But the Lord calls us to forgive. I forgive you for not contributing to me financially. I forgive you for not helping. I forgive you for my mom having to work so hard just to keep food on the table while you were out doing God knows what. I forgive you of that. And the Lord just kept telling me, bless them. Over time, the relationship got better and better. Like my kids absolutely loved them. My dad's a rock star, superstar to my kids. See, they didn't know his past. They weren't holding on to anything. So when they saw him, he was just Grandpa Ross and the greatest guy on earth. So they all played together like they were all kids. My dad and my kids played like they were all kids. He'd have the time of his life playing with my kids. So I just enjoyed every minute of it. And I thank God for putting us back together. Every single minute I was enjoying in the end, when death was certain and just a few days away, we could tell. I mean, he, he was fading and he was fading fast. In fact, one of the last conversations, in fact, the last conversation I had to him, with him, was about him being reconciled back to his father. I asked him, I said, Dad, do you still believe that Jesus Christ is the savior of the world. Do you still believe in Jesus as your savior? I want to make sure um, that my dad's life wouldn't be in vain. I want to make sure that his eternity rested with the father. And he said, I still believe, but I don't think Jesus could ever forgive a person like me. And I said, in fact, not only can he forgive you, but he will. All you have to do is ask for his forgiveness. So it was in that moment where the Lord had me to lead my father back to Christ. 
reconcile him back to himself, back to the father. So I told my dad the good news. I said, Dad, this life is not about being perfect because he kept talking about the mistakes. He kept, now he's bringing up how he didn't raise us. He's bringing up the infidelity. He's bringing up how he left my mother. He's bringing up the drugs and the jail and, and, and all of the offenses. And I said, Dad, this life isn't about being perfect. It doesn't matter what you've done. In fact, Romans 3.23 says this, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So not just you, but I'm not perfect. My mom is not perfect. Nobody that we know is perfect. In fact, Jesus was the only perfect man. So don't worry about your imperfection. God loves us so much that he can forgive us through our sins. I let him know that we all need to be forgiven for our sins. Romans 6.23 says the penalty of sin is death, physically and spiritually. So if we love Jesus more than the sin, then he won't judge us only by our sins. We all sin. We all need forgiveness. I told him that our only hope was in Jesus Christ, though. We have to put our hope in Jesus Christ. Romans 5 and 8 says, lets us know that Jesus Christ died for us on the cross for our sins. And because of that action, we're forgiven. I told him he did that for us, Dad. And then finally, I let him know in order to be saved, we have to do what it says in Romans 10, 9 and 10. We have to confess our sins and we have to believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is indeed God and that he died for our sins. And not only did he die, the good news is that he was raised from the dead. If we believe that truth in our heart, if we say out of our minds, Jesus, be my Lord. Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. Jesus, I believe that you were resurrected. Then we will be saved. In that moment, my dad said it. I was able to lead him through a simple prayer of salvation, lead him back to the father through Jesus Christ. He was now reconciled back to the father. So all that he'd done before God forgave him for, not only did he forgive him, he allowed him to be reconciled. And in the moment where my earthly father was reconciled back to his heavenly father, I was then reconciled to my earthly father because then I understood the process of reconciliation. You see, it's one thing to forgive, but I was still harboring things in my heart. I was still holding on to all of these things that I grew up struggling with. But when we reconciled, when he said yes to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ removed all, the last bit of it from my heart, I was completely reconciled with him. I wanted nothing more than to spend the last moments that we had together just being just loving one another. Nothing else mattered. The relationship was back restored. Amen. As it turned out, that was the last conversation I had with my dad. He died three days later, and that was the last time he talked. He slipped in and out of unconsciousness for three days. He had no more words that came out of his mouth. The last words that came out of his mouth was him saying yes to Jesus Christ and thanking me for helping him through that process. That was the last conversation we were able to have. In my opinion, he went out on top. What better way to have your last words be a yes to Jesus Christ? You see, God wants us all. God wants the drug addict. He wants the convict. He wants the street walker. He wants the murderer. He wants the molester. God wants us all. And if God can forgive them, who are we not to? But not only forgive them, God says, I want to be reconciled with my sons and daughters. Well, God, he did this. Don't matter. I still want him. I want the broken relationship restored. Offer him my son. Well, God, he's on death row because he did this. Doesn't matter. Offer him my son so that he can be reconciled to me. If at all possible, be reconciled. Some of you have broken relationships right now with family members. This is Christmas. This is the time where we abide in the word. If we believe it, we might as well go all out for it. This is the time where we drop our indifferences. If you're able to be reconciled, Paul says, live peaceably with all men. If God will take them back, so should you. It doesn't matter what they did. If it's possible, again, if it's possible, be reconciled. At the very least, the minimal standard is to forgive. Well, they did this to me. Forgive them. 
forgive them in your heart. Forgive them in your heart. And if God allows it, then be reconciled. Some of us this holiday season, we need to pick up the phone. We need to call our fathers. We need to call our mothers. We need to call our abusers. We need to let them know that we forgive them and work out a process of reconciliation. Amen? Amen. The Bible tells us that God, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, that with God all things are possible. The Bible tells us that it's all possible. He loves us so much that he sent his only son that through his death we may have life. I want to pray with you today. If you've never received Jesus Christ into your heart, now is the time for you. Amen. God is calling you to be reconciled to him. And the only way that we can do that, the only way that we can return to him in, by, in spirit is through the process of reconciliation. And the only way that can happen is through the son. So I want to just pray if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior or if you were like my dad, you live many years away from the will of God and you're not quite sure where your salvation lies today. Let's sure this thing up. Bow your heads, repeat after me. Lord God, I am a sinner. I am asking for forgiveness of my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And he came to this earth and he died on the cross for my sins. I believe that God the Father raised him from the dead. Jesus Christ, be my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart. Thank you, Jesus. 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 And be my Savior. If this is the first time praying that prayer, I welcome you to the family. Maybe you prayed that prayer before. But I say today, let the rest of your life be about being reconciled to the Father. And if he's truly your father and you're truly his son, speak of the good news everywhere you go. God is so good that we shouldn't be able to just contain him for ourselves. We need to do a better job, saints, in 2021 as it's coming, of sharing the goodness of God. There's so many people out there that are hopeless, that have been away from God or may have never known him. We've thrown so many people away. We've canceled so many people. We need to go pick those people up and tell them. God is good. Go tell it on the mountain, as the song says. God is good, and Jesus loves you. God sent his son for you to be reconciled. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Amen. Amen. We're going to now observe communion. So if you have your elements, go ahead and get them ready. And I'll read again from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 23. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For an often as you eat of the bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your life, for showing us the way, for dying for our sins. But we're grateful that you're a living God because you didn't stay in the grave. You rose again. Amen. Amen. We'll continue to worship and serve the Lord with our offering. Again, we're grateful. We thank you for your continual giving, for your sacrifice, for your obedience. Ways to give are up on the screen. You can give online, which is a very popular way. Many people go to our website or go straight to PayPal. But you can find the link on our ccvpalmdale.com page. You can go to donate and you'll find either a link for 
PayPal, or Givelify. You can also download the Givelify app. Just look for our church, Christ Church of the Valley Palmdale. It should pop up. You can give a one-time generous offering. You can give your tithes and put it on a continual um, link to where you, it, it will just do it automatically for you. Again, we're grateful. We thank you. You can also mail in your check. Our address is there on the screen. We're here in the city of Palmdale, 2714 East Avenue R. But that information is there. Again, we thank you for your gift. We are going to have Bible study um, this coming Tuesday. It's going to be awesome. We're in a series right now um, talking about salvation and the work of Christ. Um, it's going to be amazing this week. I believe our sister London Robinson, actually she is, she's going to be up to teach. Awesome and amazing anointed teacher. So please tune in 7 p.m. on our Christ Church of the Valley uh, Palmdale Facebook page. And also um, want to just thank you for joining us. And this has been a, a, a difficult and crazy year. We have one more service to close out the year. Um, but you know, people have been tuning in and the word, listen, the word works. The blood still covers us all from our sins um, and the word works. So I encourage you to continue to um, if, if tune in to our broadcast or uh, find a church to where God is speaking to your heart uh, so that you can continue to get the word. Amen. So we'll pray. Father, we're grateful. We thank you. We thank you for, again, just your son. We thank you for his birth. We thank you for his life, the example that our brother Jesus Christ is, our Lord, our Savior. Jesus, we're thankful for you that you took it for us, that you were sacrificed so that we may have life. So we thank you for the blood that still covers us today. God, your word says that if we say yes to your son, you will allow us back into your presence. So it's our prayer that people that have made that commitment that you continue to reveal yourself to them. Those that you'd send us to, Lord God, we pray for boldness that we can speak to them about your son, about his love, about the grace that abounds so that they may be saved as well. We know that you're coming after all of us, Lord God. We're grateful that our life is already written in the book, but send us out, Lord, as we enter into this season of Christmas Reconcile us to our family. Send us out, Lord God, so that we may find those that are lost so that they can be reconciled to you. We love you. We praise you. We're grateful for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Lastly, I want to wish you all a Merry Christmas. May God bless you. I pray that some of you will be able to spend time with family. And again, I, like I said at the top, I know it's going to be a little different. You maybe can't do the big dinner. Uh, but get with somebody, tell them that you love them. If you haven't already done so, um, extend a gift to someone else, um, a spiritual gift. Let them know that Christ loves them, a physical gift. Our kids seemed like they had everything. So we told them, y'all going to get one or maybe two gifts this year because we've been buying stuff. We've been on pandemic. I've had more Amazon packages delivered to my house this year, this year alone than I have in my whole life. So my kids are covered. So we encouraged them and said, Christmas is going to be about giving and loving and serving this year. So you know what they did? They went out and they took just about all of their birthday money that they'd acquired. And they bought everyone else presents. I mean, everybody. You come over to my house, you think that me and my wife, Latora, spent some bread this year because we got a lot of gifts underneath our tree. None of them are from us. We're so last minute, we wrap our gifts on Christmas Eve. But we got a tree full of gifts, all purchased by our children to give to other people. I couldn't be more proud of them as a father. So give a gift this year. Don't be concerned with what you got. Don't be concerned that um, it may not be everybody can, can come over this year, but extend love this year. And if you're able, um, treat someone else this year. Amen. Amen. So thank you for joining us. God bless you. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We'll see you Tuesday for Bible study. We'll be back here. Elder Lamont is going to bring the word next week. It's going to be absolutely amazing. So tune in with us next Sunday, 10 a.m. God bless you. We'll see you then.